Bom dia. Uh, bom dia, professor Brooks. Uh, first, uh, you uh, show some things about uh, your studies for the students. Ok, thanks. Uh, o professor Brooks, ele é da Universidade de Nevasca, Nebra Nebraska, desculpa, está pegando o óculos, vamos ler. É, ele recebeu vários prêmios é, científicos, atuou também em diferentes sociedades nacionais e internacionais, sociedades científicas, fundou, é, atuou no comitê de diferentes revistas, Possui mais de 200 artigos publicados, mais de 40 livros ou capítulos de livros. E ele tem ampla experiência em graduação e pós-graduação. Bom, a área de estudo do professor refere-se a estudos taxonômicos com análise filogenética de homínios parasitas, utilizando tanto os dados morfológicos como molecular para utilização é, como modelos de estudos evolutivos comparativos. Ele desenvolve um programa de pesquisa de biologia filogenética comparada e tentando entender o contexto histórico de adaptação, especiação e radiação adaptativa, coevolução, biogeografia, biogeografia histórica e evolução da comunidade. O professor Brooks, Brooks também investiga fundamentos conceituais da teoria de evolução, incluindo questões de complexidade, teoria da formação teoria da hierarquia e teoria da auto-organização. Então, é, como membro do colegiado de curso do PEA, eu gostaria de dar boas-vindas ao professor Brooks, Brooks, antes da gente iniciar a palestra. Uh, professor Brooks, it's our pleasure to host you here, and we would like to enjoy the time you spend here. Ok? Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. This is another another new place in the world for me to visit, and uh, I'm very happy to, to be here and happy to continue uh, the time that we had uh, beginning last week when I was in Curitiba and you were here and I only saw you <laughs> like that. Uh, the, the people in Curitiba now are in that position, and they look much smaller today than before, <laughs> and you look much larger. Um, now, I understand that there's a lot of very complicated technology that's involved in this uh, today, Skype and online streaming and Google and all these things that I don't know very much about. But fortunately, I have a very good friend whose name is Balash Toman, and he's 15 years old today. He's in Budapest, Hungary, and uh, he helps me a lot with trying to learn some of this computer technology. So, uh, so a special happy birthday to Balash. Now today, uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, something that has come together um, in particular in collaboration with Eric Hoberg, who is another parasitologist. He's the curator of the U.S. National Parasite Collection. And Eric and I have been working, Eric in the, in the, the Arctic regions of the world and me in the tropical regions of the world, for about the last 30 years or so, doing a combination of systematics and evolutionary biology and phylogenetics and ecology and looking at host parasite systems. And as we have been studying in, in these areas for the last 30 years, the impact of climate change on the areas where we study has become very noticeable. And at the same time, there has been the emergence of this recognition that there are many new emerging diseases on the planet. And so for the last five or six years, Eric and I have worked very hard to try to put together a, not a complete picture, but a coherent picture of why we think that climate change and the biodiversity crisis and the crisis of emerging infectious diseases are all just different faces of the same general phenomenon. And today I'm going to talk to you about that, give just sort of a general overview of, of how we see these different pieces of one puzzle all coming together and why we think there's, there's a crisis. And it's not exactly, um, perhaps, the explanation for why there is a crisis that you might hear normally in, in, uh, on the news and in the newspapers and things like that. So now I'm going to be 
my apologies to our videographer because I, even, even at the best of times, I move a lot. But I'm so technologically challenged that I'm not capable of advancing a slide without actually using this old technology. <laughs> so I will move to the computer and move back. And, and my apologies for uh, your arms are going to be tired at the end of this talk. So, oh, okay, oh, thank you. So one other thing is in my title, this particular title, now, one thing especially for the students to know, if you look at the title that was listed, that's not the title that's up here. That's because when we plan these kinds of events, the planning is usually at least six months ahead, sometimes a year ahead. And it, I need a title, okay, here's a title. And by the time the event arises and comes, you, you always have a different kind of title in mind. So one of my preoccupations, and I talked about this a bit last, uh, last week as well in the, in the other part of the course, is what I call magical thinking in science. Um, it is what I mean by magical thinking in science is situations in which we would like the world to operate in a particular way and so we use all of our scientific skills to create a reason for why the world ought to be that way. But sometimes we forget to actually go and ask the real world if that's the way it is. And this is, is, is the case, I believe, with respect to climate change and emerging diseases and biodiversity, is there's a lot of magical thinking about what is really going on. And the reality, even though it's complex, the reality is actually much more straightforward, much more understandable in terms of basic biology than we might think. So oscillations and fittings and pulses are basically just a way to talk about the dynamics of, of biological diversity. Oh, I'm stepping in front of that. Okay, sorry. Um, and and you'll see all these different words will come into play soon. So. All right. Now, most scientists agree on one thing about parasites. I mean, there's an enormous range of, of opinions about parasites. Deborah McLennan and I wrote a book one time called Periscript. It was all about the evolutionary biology of parasites. And the first chapter was the chapter on what is a parasite. And at the end of the, of the chapter, all we could conclude was that a parasite is what is studied by people who call themselves parasitologists. There really is no single definition of parasite. There's no single kind of association ecological association that defines something we call a parasite. But even though we don't have a definition of parasite, <coughs> almost everybody on this planet thinks they know what a parasite is. So we're just going to assume whatever your mental image of parasite is, just hold that. And one thing you will, you will probably believe is that whatever you think of when you think of parasite, you will think of something that is an ecological specialist. Now with respect to the parasites that, that I study, the parasites that, that are primarily organisms that live inside of vertebrate animals, uh, there are two aspects of their biology that are generally very, very specific, very specialized. One of those is <coughs> the part of the host, the part of the organism where the parasite lives. Now, it's, it's very common for different species of parasites to be capable of living in different species of hosts. But it is always true that the part of the host where the parasite lives is the same. So for example, if I go out into one of the rivers in Brazil and I collect a freshwater stingray and I take out the intestine and I want to find members of a particular genus of tapeworms with a really long name called Potomotrigonocestus and I want to find members of that genus of tapeworm I look in the very first chamber of the spiral intestine. And if there are no members of that genus of tapeworm in that first chamber of the spiral intestine, I know that there are no members of that genus of tapeworm in the entire stingray. That's very specialized, it's very specific. It's what we call microhabitat specialization. The other aspect of, of parasite biology that is extremely specialized is what we call the life cycles or transmission dynamics. 
You call them life cycles when you're preparing for an examination. You call them transmission dynamics when you're trying to... But there are two aspects of the specialization of parasites with respect to these transmission dynamics. The first is that for any particular species, the exact sequence of hosts or the sequence of activities in the environment that a parasite passes through in order to get from one host to another, one generation to another, is very specific. But it's also true that that degree of specialization is very conservative. So, and this is an example I gave in, in uh, uh, last Friday's lecture when we were talking about biodiversity and historical ecology. Everyone in this room, if I say malaria, you instantly think mosquito. Now, why is that? It's because you know that every species of malaria on this planet, no matter where it is, no matter what host it infects, all of them are transmitted by mosquitoes. That's why we can say, if someone says, ah, we've just had an outbreak of malaria in any part of the world, the first thing we say is, go control the mosquitoes. Now that's an indication of just how, how specialized and how conservative transmission dynamics are. And it's the same thing for the site specificity. So that little, little group of tapeworms in the freshwater stingrays that I was talking about, there are eight or nine species in that genus, and all of them live only in that first part of the spiral intestine in their hosts. So there are two aspects of this, this degree of specialization or specificity. One is that it's, it's very pronounced, it's very strong, a very strong part of the biology. And the other is that it's very conservative evolutionarily, very conservative phylogenetically. And that's actually a key to something that we miss in the study of emerging diseases. Oh, sorry. But it's also true that when most times when parasitologists and also many ecology stu ecologists who study insect plant systems, most times people use what is called host range as an indicator of whether an organism is a generalist or a specialist. That is, if you're only found in one species of host, the assumption is you are a specialist. If you're found in association with 10 different species of host, the assumption is that you are a generalist. And what I'm going to suggest to you is that 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 one criterion, which is the most common criterion used, is actually the worst criterion possible for determining whether something is a generalist or a specialist. And that's one of the reasons that 50 years of proposals for host range indices to help us understand generalists and specialists have always failed, because it's a bad criterion to use. It's just, I'm just in the habit of doing it, sorry. Okay, now, evolutionarily, most people who think about parasite evolution believe that there is a very tight coevolutionary interaction between hosts and parasites. That, that hosts and parasites not only are associated with each other through time, but they modify each other through time evolutionarily. This is sometimes called a coevolutionary arms race, even. And that means that most people believe, most models of coevolution function in a way that suggests that over time a relationship between a, a, a certain parasite and its host becomes more and more and more specialized to the extent that the longer the association is in existence, the more dependent the parasite is on that particular host. Now there are two implications about that point of view with respect to parasites and emerging diseases and biodiversity. The first is that if a parasite is that specialized on a particular host species, then there are two predictions in biodiversity studies. The first is, if the host goes extinct, the parasite will go extinct. The second is, if the host is transplanted to a new place, the parasite will not survive because it will not have everything it needs in its environment to maintain that highly specialized relationship with hosts. So in many cases, it's considered to be okay to introduce a species of fish, for example, into a new area, assuming that 
none, it will not bring any of its own parasites along, and also assuming that it will never acquire parasites from the local surroundings. And these are all implications of a very specific view of coevolution that says that through time, the possibility of a parasite switching to a new host will decrease because the coevolutionary interaction between that parasite and its particular host will become stronger and stronger and stronger. So that means that we don't have to worry about emerging diseases. That actually means that there should not be any emerging diseases, or there should not be very many of them, because an emerging disease requires a pathogen, a parasite, to move from an old host to a new host. And the coevolutionary dynamics that most evolutionary biologists believe in lead us to, to believe that host switches should not happen very often. The problem is that our prediction, our magical thinking about the way the universe ought to be structured, is contradicted by reality. So we believe that this increasing mutual specialization between hosts and parasites, this co-adaptation dynamic, whether it's an arms race or something else, should actually limit the ability of the, of the parasite to utilize a novel host. And if we, we see something today, and, and later next week in the, the more advanced course, we'll go through some of the analytical methods that, that have made it appear that this is, is the case. If we see evidence today that looks like host switching has occurred, either it's an artifact of the data, and there are even methods of analyzing host and parasite phylogenies that allow you to throw out the data that look like there's been host switching because we know that's, that can't be true. Or, if there really is host switching, because our evolutionary biology says it should not happen very often. If there is host switching today, that means that something unusual is happening now. And that leads us then to believe that there's something very special about today's circumstances that is causing these emerging diseases. So you either say there aren't going to be very many emerging diseases, or you say if there are emerging diseases, it's because of something strange that's happening today, not because of something that has been a feature of evolution in the past. And so we just focus on current conditions to try to explain these apparent anomalies. And this creates a paradox if, and this is what I call magical thinking, if that's the way you believe the world is, then when we go out and actually sample the real world, we're shocked because the reality is that every published example comparing host and parasite phylogenies finds evidence of host switching, including studies that have been published saying that there is no host switching. Now I know that sounds, sounds that couldn't possibly be happening in you know, objective scientific literature. If your data say they're host switching, how can you publish something saying there is no host switching? Well, this is why we have sophisticated methods of analysis so that we can eliminate inconvenient pieces of evidence. If we really don't want to see host switching, then, then I'll show you next week how we can make host switching disappear by using something that's called assumption one and assumption two um, in, in very sophisticated computer analyses. However, if you analyze host parasite data without the assumption that there's no host switching, what you find is that there's a lot of host switching. Not only is there a lot of host switching now, which we understand because there are these emerging diseases. But host switching turns out to be a very common feature of evolution. So that gives us this paradox, what, what Sal Augusta and I call, and Nicholas Janssen and I call it the parasite paradox in a, a review article published um, almost two years ago in, uh, in Zoologia. And the parasite paradox is, that everything we know about specialization leads us to believe that there should be no host switching, and yet, when we look at the historical record, there's a lot of host switching. So that's the paradox that we need to resolve. And it turns out that resolving that paradox is complicated, but 
it's possible to do it. And the first part of the paradox to resolve is this business about host range and whether or not the number of host species that you can be associated with is a direct measure of whether you are a generalist or a specialist. So the first phylogenetic pattern that we, that we need to recognize is that if you look at a large phylogeny in a group in Stockholm uh, University did this massive study where they looked at basically the tree of life for all butterflies. And then they just looked at the number of different host plant species utilized on, on the, this huge phylogeny of the butterflies. And instead of finding that all of the oldest species or all the oldest groups of butterflies are ecological generalists, and the more recently evolved groups are progressively more and more specialized, like we would think, what they found was that through time, you have periods when there's a very narrow host range, there are very few host species utilized, then there are many, then there are few, then there are many, then there are few, then there are many. So this is actually the picture of changes in host range through time. Is that sometimes, some points in evolution, uh, parasite species are associated with a very small number of hosts. Other periods of time, parasite species are associated with a lot of hosts. And this is the first piece of solving that puzzle, solving that parasite paradox, is recognizing that if species that utilize a wide range of hosts are generalists, then our evolutionary pattern is one of specialists becoming generalists, becoming specialists, becoming generalists, becoming specialists. So we have to have a mechanism for recognizing that you don't just go from being generalist to being a specialist and then go extinct. That in fact, there are not only ways for generalists to become specialists, there are ways for specialists to become generalists. And that's the next thing that we have to explain is, is that how can that happen? So this, this is what the people in Stockholm call the oscillation hypothesis. Small number of hosts, lots of hosts. Small number of hosts, lots of hosts. So if you see through time, if you see enough time and a large enough taxonomic diversity of, uh, of, of parasites, you can see the host range oscillate through time from not many hosts to a lot of hosts and back. The second part of figuring out how this can happen, figuring out how specialists can host switch, involves something we call uh, uh, ecological fitting. This is a term that Dan Jansen actually proposed uh, in the 1970s, late 60s and early 70s. Now, that part of the puzzle has to do with the relationship between being a specialist and the number of hosts that are potentially usable by a given parasite. And it, this is a, a specifically phylogenetic perspective. That is, if a species of host represents or has a particular characteristic, and it could be something to do with the intestinal morphology for a tapeworm, it could have something to do with blood physiology for something like a malaria or a trypanosome. It could be any particular trait that is the focus of survival for a parasite. It's possible for that particular trait in that particular host to be very specialized, very specific, but also if it is evolutionarily conservative, it's possible that a number of hosts may have the same trait. And we may find at one particular time, if a parasite only lives in one place, where there's only one host species that has that trait, we could m make a mistake in believing that that parasite is obligately co-adapted to that host and cannot, could not survive in any other host. But the prediction would be that there may very well be other hosts in the biosphere somewhere, living in other places, that have exactly the same trait as the host you're looking at because of common ancestry, that trait that particular physiology, that particular structure in the intestine or whatever, may be very, very specific, but it may be evolutionarily conservative. And so there may be a wide range of hosts that all have the same very special, represent 
the same very specialized ecology to the parasite. So a human being may come along and say, oh look, there are five different hosts. But the parasite may not actually see them as being different species of hosts. The parasite may just see them as all being the same kind of, of resource. That's ecological fitting. So now we'll do a little thought experiment just to show you what I mean about how you can be an extreme resource specialist and still host switch a lot, and host switch in a lot of different ways. Now you've seen this before, uh, those of you who were here last Friday, you've seen this thing before, where you have, this is a phylogeny for a hypothetical group of hosts. And there is the one, the thick line for host species G, and above it is that little one. That's, that's a parasite. Now this is a picture of a situation in which the parasite requires a particular ecological resource that only host G has. And so what we observe is that that parasite is only associated with that species of host. This is a sort of situation in which if the host goes extinct, the parasite's going to go extinct because that's the only source of the resource the parasite needs. It also means that that parasite will never become an emerging disease in another host because no other host has the resource that the parasite needs to survive. Now, what happens if the resource that parasite that host G has, suppose it is still the same very specific resource, but now that resource is a synapomorphy of a group of species, G and its two closest relatives. All three of those species have that same very specific resource because they're descended from a unique common ancestor in which that resource arose. Now today you may find parasite 1 only in association with host G, but this distribution of that very specialized resource tells you that there are two other host species somewhere in the world that the parasite would see as being the identical resource. And so one of the predictions we could make from this is that there are two other host species that are at risk. If host G ever comes into contact with, with that parasite, with either of the other two hosts, we would predict that the parasite would immediately move into the other host because the parasite would not see those other hosts as being different from the original host because with respect to the resource that is critical for the parasite survivor, survival, all three of those host species are the same thing. And this is a way that you can have host switching occur really quickly without any change in genetic information on the part of the parasites at all. All you need is a change of geography, change of ecology, change of, of, of context, ecological context. Now, in this particular case, you could say, well, that's not really a different situation because all three of those hosts are clay. They, are, they do represent one particular evolutionary line, a unitary evolutionary line. So the hosts are still closely related. So really, that's not the same thing. What if you now have that same very specialized resource, but it's so old that it's plesiomorphic? It's a, it's a, a retained ancestral characteristic. Now, because it's a retained ancestral characteristic, the host species that have that specific resource that the parasite is specialized on do not form a group. They're, they are, quote unquote, not closely related. But the trait that they share, that is the focus of the parasite, is, has a common ancestry. It's just very, very old. And this is a situation in which the hosts that are potentially susceptible are not closely related. And this is exactly the kind of situation in which we would want to think that a parasite that's found in all of those hosts is a generalist, and a parasite that is found in only one of them is a specialist. But as far as the actual ecology is concerned, the actual evolution is concerned, this is still a case of a specialist. The parasite is still a specialist. It's specialized on one particular trait. And the same thing is even true if that particular resource is a convergently evolved trait among hosts that are really, really distantly related. So it turns out that there actually are a, a lot of ways 
that parasites could host switch easily without becoming generalists. So it's actually very easy if phylogenetic inheritance is conservative, if the evolution of the resource that the parasite is, is focused on is phylogenetically conservative, you can have extreme resource specialists still capable of host switching easily. Being able to host switch easily in this way through ecological fitting is, is what then sets the stage for a parasite to become a generalist. So the first thing that happens is you switch into a lot of different host species that have the same resource initially. But now, the parasite is spread out over different species in different areas. The geographic range is larger. The local selective pressures are different. Each of the host species is not identical. It may have the same resource, but nothing is absolutely identical. At that point, you now have the possibility of localized, what John Thompson calls the coevolutionary mosaic, lots of localized coevolutionary coadaptational phenomena, which then produce a generalist species, which then allows the next wave of geographic isolation to subdivide that generalist into a whole bunch of specialists. And then you go from being a specialist to being a widespread a, a specialist on a widespread resource that's phylogenetically conservative to being a generalist to then producing new specialists. And this is how ecological fitting allows the oscillation or leads to the oscillation uh, phenomenon that we see. Now it turns out that in order for all of this ecological fitting to have an impact on things like bi parasite biodiversity and emerging diseases, you have to give up the notion that fitness space is some sort of tightly optimized evolutionary space. The entire history of neo-Darwinism has been a history of trying to apply optimality theory to everything we see. It's, this is sometimes called uh, foamy adaptationism or the adaptationist program, things like that. Everything is, is an adaptation. Everything is specifically adapted for what it does. It's also sometimes called Panglossian adaptationism. And as Niles Eldridge has pointed out, this thinking that has, has permeated neo-Darwinism in the second half of the 20th century completely messes up the distinction between Darwinian and Lamarckian explanations. And, and in reality, if fitness space is always really tightly optimized, you don't have host switches. In order to have host switching, in order to have ecological fitting, and in order for ecological fitting to set the stage for these oscillations between generalists and specialists, you actually have to believe that fitness space, even if it's specific, it's very sloppy. There is a lot of room to move. Even in ecological specialization, there is a lot of flexibility in fitness space. There is not a tight match. Now, in reality, we should, we should understand this because natural selection itself is powerful in inverse proportion to how optimal the fit is between organisms and their environments. If everything is perfectly adapted to its environment, there is no natural selection. Everything's there. It's fit. Natural selection only occurs when there's a mismatch between organisms and their surroundings. And that's why host range is a bad trait for us to use when we're talking about generalists and specialists. Now, in the case of the organisms that I work with, parasitic flatworms in particular, we have an additional problem. Because our textbooks, parasitology textbooks, are full of cases in which they say well, our parasites are much different than things like insects that feed on plants. Because insects that feed on plants feed on a wide range of plants. They oviposit on a wide range of plants, whereas our organisms are restricted to one host. Well, where do we get that idea? That's very simple. If you want to understand the evolution of host specificity in the digenetic trematodes, you go to the species lists for the digenetic trematodes. And what you discover is that 80% of digenetic trematodes 
only infect one species of host. The problem is that 75% of all named species of trematodes are only known from the original description. One place, one host, one time. This is zero degrees of freedom taxonomic inventory work. Now think about all the intensive inventory work that's been done with insects and plants, primarily driven by agricultural concerns. We know an enormous amount about the host range for insects that eat plants because we've studied them more. There are only a few cases in which you can go to the literature for things like trematodes and do a simple correlation analysis between the number of times a parasite has been reported in the literature and the number of different host species that have been reported. Now the cases where, where you can do that kind of study, the coefficient the correlation coefficient is about 0.95. Now for 15 years, I ran a parasite inventory in a, a conservation area in northwest Costa Rica. Every species of parasite that we found that had already been described was found in a host that had never been reported before, all of them. So a lot of what we think is true about host specificity and host range for, for the parasites of vertebrates, the parasitic worms and vertebrates, is an artifact of, of almost non-existent inventory work and almost complete lack of any systematic approach to doing parasite inventories. So we have to be really, really careful about that. All right, so let me give you a, just a quick example. There are two species of nematodes that infect great apes and their closest relatives. And these two species of nematodes have been used in the past as exemplars of the one-to-one -one relationship between host biology and parasite biology. And a student of mine and I did a, a phylogenetic analysis on these, these, these two groups of parasites. And, oops, sorry. This diagram is, is a representation of the phylogenetic history of the two groups of parasites in the context of the host that they infect. And all of the thick lines represent places where the parasite phylogenies and the host phylogenies agree. And all the thin lines represent cases of a host switching. Now, only 40% of these relationships are the result of host switching. But remember that these are groups for which we, the, the, these are groups that were supposed to be paradigms of non-host switch, switching coevolution. So these are groups that were supposed to show a one-to-one -one relationship between the host phylogeny and the parasite phylogeny. And that's 40% wrong. So our whole vision about the world is, of coevolution is 40% wrong, at least, maybe more. And there are many cases in which host switching has been even, even greater in the literature. Now, what I want to do now is just to not think about the parts of, of that diagram where the host and the parasite phylogenies are the same because that's actually not very interesting. That's just a byproduct of common history. It means nothing unusual happened. What we really want to do is to talk about the host switches because you have to remember that 15 million years ago when those host switches were happening, every one of those would have been an emerging disease. So we really want to know, what about those things? You know, when do they occur? How do they occur? Is, are there any general patterns? And does that have anything to tell us about today? So the first thing to recognize is that all of those host switches, with only one exception, are host switches among great apes and their closest relatives, old world primates. So all of these host switches are host switches among quote unquote closely related species. There's only one case in which there's a host switch, and this is a host switch from a primate to a rodent. Now that's a case in which we would really want to focus our study and say, all right, here, something really different must have happened. Because otherwise it's just one monkey, another monkey, another monkey. Okay, so there's just host switching among primates, 
this doesn't, this all looks like it could be the result of ecological fitting. Just changing ecology, changing geography, but we don't have to invoke any kind of real evolutionary change on the part of the parasites. But switching from a primate to a rodent, that seems like that would take something. You would have to evolve some kind of different physiology. And maybe not, but if these things really are specialists, then that's the one place and the only place in the study where you would go and look to see whether or not there was a real co-evolutionary or evolutionary genetic revolution that led to the host switch. So this model of the parasites evolve some sort of new genetic ability to go out and infect a new kind of host. That perspective on emerging diseases. Something strange is happening genetically so that we're now getting more and more pathogens with the ability to get into new hosts. As opposed to ecological fitting, which says, no, the ability to get into those hosts was already there. All you had to do was to bring them together. So all but one of those host switches was between uh, hominoids and circopathesis, old world monkeys and great apes, which says basically it's either co-speciation, that is everything's just living together and evolving together, or there's host switching among close relatives as a result of ecological fitting. So all but one case of the association in this entire study could, can be explained by host switching opportunistically and all of these parasites being ecological specialists during the entire process. And only one of them requires that there might have been something unusual that would happen. So this gives us a different perspective on, on how often it is that something unusual, that there's a genetic revolution in the parasites that allows them to go to a new host. It also turns out that when you look at the episodes, the actual episodes of, of host switching in that study, it's not random, it's not stochastic, it's not sprinkled through time. Almost all of those host switches happened in bursts. There are particular episodes in time during the last 30 million years in which there are boom, a bunch of host switches, boom, a bunch of host switches. And each of those episodes of host switching is associated with or is correlated with an episode of climate change. And Eric, this is the, 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 the fundamental contribution that Eric Hoberg has made over the last 30 years. And he's studied groups of organisms going way, way, way back, all the way into the Mesozoic. And so we have many different time periods, many different host groups, marine, terrestrial, tropics, arctic. It doesn't matter, the pattern is the same. Host switching happens in bursts. Host switching is punctuated, it's episodic. And every one of those episodes of, of or outbreaks of host switching is associated with a period of climate change. Now, that is the key to understanding what drives things like oscillating the, the oscillations and the host switches. What is it that drives species through sloppy fitness space? And it turns out that you only need to do two things to make host switches by ecological fitting happen. You either change the geographic distribution of the, the parasite or you change the trophic structure of the ecosystem in which the parasite lives. In both cases, you allow the parasite to come into contact with hosts that are susceptible, but were not exposed previously. And every time the parasite comes into contact with a host that has the same specialized but phylogenetically conservative resource as the original host, there will be rapid host switching. There will be rapid emergence of an emergent disease. And now what we need to do is to, the third part to resolve that whole parasite paradox is to find a mechanism that drives that. What drives changes, massive changes in geographic distributions and massive changes in trophic structure and ecosystems. And it turns out that all you need to do that 
is periodic episodes of climate change. We would then predict that emerging diseases, these host switches, are a byproduct of a more general phenomenon, a general phenomenon that we see in historical biogeographic studies of hosts as well as parasites, in which major episodes of climate change result in massive changes in geographic distributions. We tend to think sometimes, oh, the climate changes, things go extinct. No. When the climate changes, things move around. And some things go extinct. And some things do better. Some species expand their range. Many things will move to new areas. <coughs> and all of those kinds of dynamics have the effect of changing geographic distributions of species so that new species come into contact with each other. And that tends to change trophic relationships within ecosystems and create new ones. And all of those bring parasites into contact with novel hosts. But those novel hosts are not something new. In, colonizing those novel hosts does not very often require some genetic revolution in pathogenicity. What it requires is evolution and ecology and biogeography. And Darwin, of course, recognized a long time ago that geographic distributions through time were, were a fundamental element of understanding evolution. So all I've been talking about to this point is the parasites, the parasites, the parasites. So now we look at the hosts, those primates, for those species of parasites. And we're going to look at them in the context of other vertebrates during the last 30 million years. And what we find out is that the geographic distributions of hyenas and humans and elephants, well, not just humans, but all, all hominoids, during the last 30 million years has been the same. There's not a hyena biogeography, there's not an elephant biogeography, there's not a hominoid biogeography. There is Miocene biogeography in Africa and Eurasia. And hominoids were embedded in that with their parasites. And what we find when we look at the historical biogeography of that assemblage of organisms through time is we find alternating cases of groups being isolated in one place, say in Africa. The climate changes and everything spreads out from Africa out across Eurasia over to Asia. The climate changes again and things are isolated. Climate changes again, things that were isolated in Asia then spread from east to west, back into Africa. And so we have these waves of out of Africa, out of Asia, out of Africa, out of Asia, as the anthropologists call it. And you have widespread movements of things. You have changes in geographic distributions. You have changes in local communities occurring. And each time one of those episodes occurs, host switches are going to happen you're going to have an outbreak of emerging diseases. So there is a, a strong evolutionary signal in, in host switching, which is the fundamental diagnostic feature of an emerging disease, and climate change, and geographic movements. So rather than the old co-evolutionary arms race kind of model, that what I, what I call magical thinking about the way hosts and parasites get along with each other. What we have is, is a more complicated model that's actually based on what we observe in nature. And it, and it has these three parts. It has the observation of these host range oscillations, the oscillation between specialists and generalists and specialists and generalists. That being a specialist is not a one-way street. We have the observation of ecological fitting, the mechanism for rapid host switching, rapid increase in the range of hosts under changing geographic circumstances. And we have the taxon pulse dynamic, which is the climate change driven dynamic for changes, wholesale changes in the geographic distribution and trophic structure for biotas on the, on the planet. Now all of that together tells us that in fact, Emerging diseases under particular circumstances should actually be 
really common. So parasite diversity and host parasite associations are mostly under the control of things that are associated with climate change and species moving around and ecosystems changing their trophic structure. Not so much under the control of the localized coevolutionary adaptations, mutual modifications that do occur, but those are not the drivers of diversity. The, what drives diversity is what sets up the circumstances for those kinds of localized coevolutionary mosaics to exist. Now, the real question to ask is, is this of interest to more than just a bunch of evolutionary biologists and, and people who study esoteric sorts of things in their universities and field stations? Well, if it turns out that the evolutionary picture is accurate, that every time there's a major climate change event that drives changes in geographic distributions and changes in ecological structure, that every time that happens there's a massive outbreak of host switching, which is just a synonym for emerging diseases, then there really is cause for concern. Because species introductions and global climate change and human beings expanding their geographic range into areas they've never been before are all happening right now. So one of the things that we should predict from this is that as much as we think that there are, you know, there are emerging diseases every year now, they're new, something new shop pops up every year, we should be concerned that because we haven't yet seen really, really strong influences of climate change, those are still 20 or 30 years away, we should be concerned that when that happens in 20 years, we're going to see massive outbreaks of emerging diseases. Not just in humans, but we're going to see them in our livestock, we're going to see them in our crops, we're going to see them in our wildlife. All of those host switches that are going to happen, driven by climate change, occur without any genetic change in the parasites. Yeah, right now we have this model, and it's a really good economic model if you work for a pharmaceutical agency. Every time there's an emerging disease, we have to spend massive amounts of money sequencing the new pathogenic variant. I mean, we know it must be different because it's jumped to a new host. So there must, some new evolutionary, some new genetic marker must have occurred. Some gene for pathogenicity has somehow been activated. Maybe it's been activated by climate change. And so climate change is actually driving evolutionary change in the genome, which is creating these pathogenic mutants that are out there jumping into the new hosts. Now that creates a really profitable workflow for pharmaceutical agencies, because it means you've got to spend money on sequencing like crazy, and you have to sequence like crazy because these things haven't changed genetically. It's ecological fitting. It's not a genetic revolution. So they sequence like crazy, that costs money. But fortunately, you have people who are buying your pharmaceuticals, you just charge them more money for the pharmaceuticals. And then, because you know that this is a new version of the pathogen, because it's in a new host, you have to develop a specific vaccine and a specific drug for it, which is more profit. So there's a problem here. I mean, you don't expect corporations to act with any kind of compassion. I mean, corporations are psychotic. Their job is to make profit, no matter who it hurts. That's what corporations do. But what if the corporation that's behaving in its normal psychotic way, maximizing profit regardless of the consequences, suppose that corporation has also been given the responsibility by society to protect society? There's a conflict between providing medical technology that helps save people and the reality that if you save too many people, you actually you're going to cut profits. There's, there's a real socioeconomic element to all of this that you cannot expect the pharmaceutical companies to resolve in favor of the well-being of human beings. They will not cut their profit margins just because you think it would be good if your child did not get sick. 
as far as they're concerned, every time your child gets sick, you're a customer. And of course it's nice if your child gets well, but it would even be better if your child got sick the next year and needed the drug again. So we have to understand that emerging diseases are not caused by climate change making genetic changes in parasites. That's not how it works. Any kind of genetic differences in the host switching population are going to be the result of founder effect. So there will be some population genetical signal of host switching because when you move to a new host, the first parasites that move into a new host species as a result of ecological fitting are going to be a statistical subset of the parasite population in the original host. So at the population genetic level, you will see differences. But those differences will be the differences that you expect to see in founder effect phenomena, in standard population genetics. It's not going to be the result of some new genetic information. We also expect there to be pathogenicity during these host switches. Not because the parasites have come up with a new way to attack the new host, but because the new hosts, even though they represent a, an evolutionarily conservative resource, the host species itself has never been exposed to that parasite in the past. They're susceptible, but they've never been exposed. And because natural selection does not operate on things that do not happen, in those cases, there has never been the possibility of selection for resistance or accommodation, co-accommodation between the host and parasite. So we would predict that even if it's just ecological fitting, initially there would be an outbreak of acute disease. But we would also expect selection to operate very quickly to produce enough resistance so that the host-parasite relationship would calm down. So we would expect, without any kind of new genetic change in the parasite at all, we would expect the first period, first phase in a host switch to, be the, to result in an outbreak of acute disease, followed by the evolution of resistance, which would then turn that, host, that new host-parasite relationship into a chronic phenomenon, with occasional outbreaks of acute pathogenicity. And this is exactly the pattern we see in all of these emerging diseases, or almost all of them. Things like Ebola don't seem to play that game, but they, they're also kind of self-limiting. Once you know where Ebola is, everybody moves away, and it's not a problem anymore. But in the, in, for the most part, you see this acute outbreak, and then it subsides. Now, the problem is that during the acute outbreak, there's a lot of television coverage about this emerging disease. Big panic, big crisis. Lots of committees formed by, by politicians, many papers published, lots of press conferences, lots of hand-wringing, lots of money thrown to the pharmaceutical agencies. Please, sequence more. How much money do you need to do more sequences? Make a new vaccine. Make it tomorrow. Money, money, money. Talk, talk, talk. As we say in Spanish, mucha charla, poca acción. <laughs> yap, 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 nothing happens. And by the time all that yapping is over, the parasite's not a problem anymore because two years later it's calmed down, it's not an acute problem anymore, it's chronic, everyone forgets about it. It disappears from the newspapers, so most people think, we cured it, it's gone. But they never go away. West Nile virus in, in North America, it's still there. And this past summer there was a little flare-up and a bunch of people died. Just to remind us, we're still here. <laughs> every so often, we're going to kill some of your children, or maybe some of your grandparents. But everybody in the middle, you're OK. This is, they're, they're, this is so common now that in biodiversity, the biodiversity of emerging diseases, there's even a term called pathogen pollution. These things accumulate. 
And even if they're not acute, even if they're just chronic problems, every one of these quote-unquote new diseases costs public health systems some money. And so the question is, how many of these do we have to accumulate before the costs of monitoring all of these new diseases become so great that national public health systems no longer have the ability to function? At what point do we accumulate so many of these emerging diseases that the system collapses? And it collapses because we are spending money trying to, to treat something that isn't there. We're spending money trying to find the evolution of these pathogenetic genes, which don't exist. We're spending money on vaccines and sequencing when what we really need to be talking about is ecology and evolution. And we don't do that. And this is just what I, what I said. Now, what we expect is every time there's one of these host switches, there should be an impact. But we should expect selection for resistance to be quite rapid, actually, especially in the cases of ecological fitting, where the parasites are going into hosts that are similar enough to the original host that they have the same kind of resource. You expect them, then, to have the same kind of, of inherent background, genetic background, which would include this more or less same abilities to evolve resistance. And we expect that to happen. We also interfere with natural selection. And we do that with our pharmaceutical industry. Every time there's a disease outbreak and we throw massive amounts of antibiotics at that pathogen, we are creating a large-scale experiment in natural selection in which we are forcing the pathogen to adapt to the pharmaceutical agent. And we are eliminating the possibility of any kind of evolved resistance between the pathogen and the human immune system because the pathogen is adapting to the pharmaceutical agent and that shields the human immune system from actually ever seeing the pathogen. And so you end up with people who've been given drugs for diseases all their lives and they're not as healthy today as somebody who never had any drugs at all because their immune systems are still naive. They have never been allowed to learn. They've never been allowed to evolve resistance. So there are ways in which we are potentially making the problem worse as a result of trying to make it better. So that's why we say that this, this planet is a minefield of emerging diseases waiting to happen. All you need to have an emerging disease explode out is to have climate change, species introduction, expanding human population. Any one of those, much less all three together, will lead us to believe that there, will, there are going to be many more emerging diseases in the near future. You have to remember that that study of the, the great ape nematodes, all 40% of those host switches, every one of those was an emerging disease at the time it happened. And presumably, 40% of what was happening to the parasites of elephants and hyenas and everything else in those, those ecosystems at that time during those periods, 40% of what was happening with all of those parasites systems globally at that time were emerging diseases. That's the kind of thing we're looking at in the future. Now it turns out that it's even kind of worse than that. If you just look outside of parasitology, if you have the perspective that I've given you today, that means that if you study parasites, you should be looking at things published by paleontologists, for example. The paleontologists tell us, people like, like uh, Bruce Lieberman and Alicia Stegall, their studies have shown us that there's a strong correlation between species that are capable of moving around a lot and species that have large populations and the species that survive climate change events. 
So we know a lot, the paleontologists know a lot about species that are capable of surviving global climate change events. This is bad news for emerging diseases because the parasites that are most capable of surviving by host switching due to ecological switching are precisely the parasites that are going to survive climate change. Now, one of the fundamental insights that Eric Hoberg's research showed us was this exact phenomenon. Eric Hoberg was studying the parasites of marine mammals and marine birds in the Arctic. And he discovered that the lineages of parasites in marine mammals and marine birds in the Arctic are far older than the marine birds and the marine mammals. They are parasites that were originally in hosts that were wiped out by the mass extinction event at the KT boundary. And all of their original hosts went extinct and none of the parasites, well not none of them, but a lot of the parasites did not. You had a lot of parasites, so parasites, it turns out, are extremely good at surviving mass extinctions due to climate change. And it's because of this flexibility allowed by ecological fitting. So the very hosts that are going to be best at surviving climate change are the ones that are going to be full of parasites. So we can't expect climate change events to help us by causing lots of parasites to go extinct. Quite the opposite. It also turns out that ecological fitting is bad news for all of our programs in biological control. The only good thing about it is we now understand why all of our programs in biological control have failed. And they failed because we believed our own magical thinking about the specificity of the host-parasite relationship. We thought those parasitoids, because in their natural area, they only attack one particular pest insect, we assumed that that's all they would do where they were introduced. So the pest insect is actually accidentally introduced to a new area. No problem. We'll introduce its parasitoid to the new area, and it will self-limit. The parasitoid will right, wipe out the, the pest population or, or limit it, and because they're so tightly co-evolved, the parasitoid's not going to escape containment. And, it, and we're always shocked especially in situations where you import a parasitoid to control and introduce pests, and the first thing you know is the parasitoid then jumps onto the obligate pollinators of the fruit trees that the pest was eating. And you've actually made things worse. And that's because nobody ever did experiments about ecological fitting. Nobody ever asked if there was anybody in the new environment that had the same resource. And the number of cases in which we've made that mistake, it's massive. And you've made that mistake virtually every single case we've tried a biological control agent. So ecological fitting means that, that we, we, would, we really ought to rethink everything about biological control. At the very least, we need to do a lot more experiments before we release a biological control agent. And it's our own fault, and now I'm talking about professional biologists. It's our own fault because we don't know anything about the biosphere. During the time that there was a lot of public support for taxonomists and field biologists, museum taxonomists, for example, during the period when there were lots and lots of people doing that, they didn't work very hard. They collected a lot. I had a friend of mine who said that if we wanted to have a biological expedition to the part of the world where we could just have the largest concentration of undescribed species, we should send that expedition to the Smithsonian. We have massive, massive collections of undescribed things in the major museums of the world. Well, nobody thought there was going to be a climate change event or anything like that, so they just sort of, you know, everybody's having a good time. Low energy, not a lot of publications, collecting a lot of stuff. The result is that we know almost nothing about the biosphere. We know just enough to make us worry about what's coming in the near future. But we don't know nearly enough to be able to adapt properly and quickly enough to it. And because we now understand that we don't have enough actual data, now there are massive amounts of money being poured into making models 
But that's not what we need. I mean, yes, models are fine. We need to use models to generalize what's going on. But we need more actual information. Data, 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 data. And that's what I, as I said last Friday, this is what I call the, the Dirty Harry criterion. Do you feel lucky, punk? Do you think we've got enough information and good enough models to actually deal with what's coming? And for those of you in the audience who are graduate students, do you think we've got enough information for you to risk your children's future? Because when your children are 20 years old, things are going to be really different. That storm that just hit the eastern part of the United States, that's the new normal. Weather reports that say, oh, it's going to rain tomorrow, and tomorrow it's sunny. That's the new normal. So if there really is a biodiversity crisis, if there really is climate change, if there really are emerging diseases, we don't actually have much time. We don't have enough time to just mess around doing things the way we've always done them. We can't continue business as usual. We have to cooperate. And by cooperating, I mean, instead of hiring another ecosystem modeler, we should hire a taxonomist. Instead of hiring another biotech person to run another bank of sequencers, we should hire a taxonomist. Instead of putting money into massive genomics projects, we should put money into massive inventory projects. Who's going to cooperate? Who's going to say, you know what, I'd love to have a million dollars, but I'm going to only keep 200000 of that, and the other $800,000, I want that to go to taxonomic inventories. That's the roadblock. That's the roadblock that we're facing right now. And at some point, it's, you know, we either decide that this is important and we do it, or we wait until the crisis hits, and then we say, oh, gee, I wish I had known. I would have given up some of the money. So we can't stop climate change. We can't reverse it. And I don't care what any politician says. I love Barack Obama, especially in comparison with what came before him and <laughs> what may, may come after next Tuesday. But he's not part of this solution to a solution to this. No politicians on this planet are part of a solution yet. Because not dealing effectively with this crisis is good business. And dealing effectively with the crisis is not good business. And the worst time to get any politician to try to do the right thing is when there's an economic crisis. And then you end up with this situation which, well, this year it's a bad economy. Next year it's something else. Next year it's something. Eventually we'll get around to handling the environment. Eventually we'll get around to climate change. We don't have the time. This is, this is on us. The crisis is here. So I would finish by, by repeating something that I heard 20 years ago at a United Nations conference. 20 years ago. A Swedish delegate to a, to a UNESCO conference got up and said, think, local, think globally, act locally, and everybody's like, yeah, 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 he said. And then he said, start now. And everybody went, what? <laughs> and that was 20 years ago. And nobody started. And so now, it's critical. Now we have to do something. Or we just let it happen to us. By the time that happens, I'll be dead. But for many of you, your children are going to be young adults, and you may have three-year-old grandchildren. And then you're going to really feel it. So on that cheery note, thank you very much for your attention.
Chief and wants to ask any questions, they want coffee. <laughs> Está aberto o canal do Curitiba. Walter? You can't see this. Everyone in Curitiba is just running home. <laughs> Walter, it's okay. Hello, Walter. <laughs> Do you have questions? All last week you were in that position. You were just sitting here going, <laughs> and, and seriously, if you have, if any of you have questions about any of the, anything I talked about last week, this is a good time to ask as well. I know some of you are going to come into the field tomorrow for a few days and we can talk then, but um, you know, I'm here for a limited amount of time, but my time is yours while I'm here. Hi. Thanks a lot for Thanks a lot. <laughs> Uh, thanks a lot for your lecture. It's so interesting. Thanks. But uh, I would like to hear something more about introducing these species because it's uh, a major problem you have maybe in the fluid plain and not another environment, uh, freshwater environments. And uh, every time you read about the introduced species, is a potential introduced uh, para parasites introduced. So, but you, you say that it's not so true. Maybe it's not the um, possibility to white beard of the paradise. So, we would like to talk right. about right. that. Right. No, that's a really good point. Yeah, we have this. We have this. We understand that introducing species is not a good thing, okay, in general. But we also believe that the one good thing about introducing species is that you believe that the introduced species never will bring its own parasites along, and those parasites will never jump into native hosts. We believe this very strongly. It turns out not to be true. We have a situation a really nice study that, that uh, was done in, in Costa Rica um, and primarily uh, by a, a colleague of mine, uh, uh, Virginia Leon from, uh, from Mexico, from UNAM in, in Colima, Mexico. What we discovered was a species of parasite in northwestern Costa Rica that occurs in a native species of frog. But it turns out that when you, when you first you identify it and you go, wait a minute, uh, maybe my taxonomy is wrong, but this looks like a parasite from the United States. So then you do the molecular work and you discover that not only is it a North American species of frog parasite, but we're actually able to tell exactly where in the United States it came from. And then we start doing some detective work and it turns out that 30 years ago, 40 years ago now, there was an attempt to introduce bullfrogs. It's a North American species of frog. Big, big legs, edible. There was an attempt to introduce that bullfrog into San Jose, Costa Rica, which is up high. So it's like more or less like Curitiba. So it's, a, it's not a tropical environment. It's cold enough that the frogs might survive and so on. And the idea was, well, we'll introduce these in Costa Rica and it'll be a new food production enterprise and things like that. It didn't work. There are, are specimens of bullfrogs collected around, coast, around San Jose up until the 1980s. But by, by, 19, by the 1970s, the experiment was over, the frogs were gone. And so far as we know, there are no bullfrogs left in Costa Rica at all. 
But one of the parasite species that came with those bullfrogs is 400 kilometers in a straight line through the jungle in a native frog in northwest Costa Rica. And it's doing fine. And this is the kind of thing that, that Eric Cooper uh, discovered with the marine mammal parasites. There's, you have a situation in which it's a natural dynamic where something like a plesiosaur has a tapeworm. And the plesiosaur goes extinct, but a marine mammal moves in. And as the plesiosaurs are going extinct and the marine mammals are moving in, the marine mammals are eating the same food as the plesiosaurs. So they're picking up the parasite. Parasite doesn't care. It's just they just the parasite just needs to be inside the intestine of a vertebrate, and the plesiosaur goes extinct. The parasite survives. This is the complement, the complementary aspect of that, where you introduce the parasite, the host goes extinct, but the parasite survives. So this this turns out to be, you know. Everything that we thought we knew is wrong. I mean, some, what made us think that parasites were not going to be opportunistic like everything else? We also find cases now where we introduce a species and, and the native parasites jump into it. So we also thought that, well, if we introduce a species because we want it to be there, it will be safe from the native pathogens because it's not... They, they haven't co-evolved with those native pathogens, so they won't switch into them. It turns out that's not true either. So we have all these situations in which every, everything unexpected is happening in some case or another. And, and that's why it turns out that species introductions are a mess. The species that we wanted to introduce don't do as well as we expected. The species we introduced accidentally are doing better than we want. And, it turns out that the reason for this is because all we do with species introductions is accelerate a natural process. In the past, any episode of climate change resulted in species introducing themselves to new areas. And we just move that faster. And the problem with that is, all right, we're mimicking a dynamic, but we're making it go so fast that, that evolution doesn't have an opportunity to work. We're, we're making, we're speeding up the process so much that selection can't cope with the situation. And if fitness space is, is sloppy, then all, all kinds of, of unexpected possibilities can occur because we don't know the system well enough. And then we also do stupid things. For example, in, in North America now, there is this spe introduced species called the grass carp. And it turns out that if you go to Asia, it's also called the Asian carp. If you, if you go to Asia where the things are native and, and you find places where the fish are raised in tanks with nothing but vegetation, they eat the vegetation like crazy and they're about this big. So they were introduced into the United States to put in ponds that were eutrophic, that is very high nutrient level, so a lot of algal growth. And the idea was that they'll, they will control the plants, keep the plant, aquatic plant level down, then we can put in other fish that we want to do for sport fishing. Brilliant. One year after the state of Arkansas began introducing these grass carp into ponds all over the state of Arkansas, a graduate student at the University of Arkansas said, I'm going to do an experiment. Here's an aquarium with plants. Boop. Drop the grass carp in, chowing down on plants. Here's an aquarium with plants and other fish. Put the grass carp in, it turns into a predator. It's just chowing down. It can survive on the grass, but if there's meat on the diet, they're going to eat it. And they go, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Nobody told us about this. And by that time, of course, there had been rainstorms that had washed out a dam and, and one of the lakes had opened up. Boom, boom, boom. So now those carp are everywhere. They wash out of Arkansas into the Missouri River system, which washes into the Mississippi River system. They move upstream 
they are now probably in the Great Lakes. There's a desperate attempt to try to keep them from getting into the Great Lakes. It's probably unsuccessful because the, the natural resources people in Illinois are admitting that they find them within two or three kilometers of the Great Lakes, but they're not there yet. Yeah, right. It's like saying, I'm a little bit pregnant. <laughs> and once they're, once they're in the Great Lakes, they're going to they're gonna kill everything. They're going to wipe everything out. Oh, and the other thing, too, is that when they're eating meat, they're now getting specimens from the Mississippi River that are 100 kilos. These, they become big fish when they have a diet of other fish. And they compete for nesting sites, and they're big, and they're aggressive. It's, it's, it's a real mess, and it's our fault. We did it to ourselves with government funding. And it's all based on this magical thinking about the nature of evolved specialization. And the idea that every single species on this planet has a very tightly optimized fitness space. And if you move it outside of that at all, it won't do so well. And it turns out that fitness space is not that tightly optimized. Every species is capable of, of surviving in other places. And many species are capable of doing better in new places than in the place that they, they originated strictly as an accident of history. So that's why we have some cases where an introduced species actually does better where it's been introduced than in its native area. Like house sparrows, the English sparrow in North America. I mean, they're everywhere. They're an enormous pest. You go to Europe, you have to really work hard to find them. It's like, hey, I, I saw an English sparrow today. I'll put that on my life list. In North America, the thing's just, they're everywhere. And we just, we see this over and over and over again. And if you change, you know, you have major climate change events. Area, some areas get drier, some get wetter, some get warmer, some get colder. And things are going to move around even more. So, that's, that's not a happy answer, I'm afraid. <laughs> it's okay, thanks. First of all, I would like to, to thank you for, for here. <laughs> so thank you for your lecture. I love it. And the title, it was like Resolving the Parasite Paradox. But uh, I'm not working with, par with parasites. I, I'm, I'm working with migration, with fish migrations. And I was listening to your your lecture and I was thinking all the time that and in the last uh, months I've been thinking in the evolution of the uh, migration in fish in, in freshwater fishes and what what, what were the mechanisms that uh, um, allow the um, like uh, the, that widespread uh, or that <laughs> that uh, wide spectrum of, of like uh, Silvia, fala espanhol. Ele fala ah, espanhol. Mas você não. Mas entende. Que que foi o que? Pues estaba pensando que esa, la, esa, esa paradoja de los pulsos, la, los, los cambios de pues, las oscilaciones, puede explicar también como las, las, la radiación evolutiva en las, en las estrategias de migración de peces de agua dulce. Porque pues me estaba como atormentando en la cabeza, cómo llegan pues, peces que son... Hola. No. Sí, sí, sí. 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 Pero... ¿Cómo, ¿Cómo llegan a, pues, en, en, en ríos, cierto? Sí. ¿Cómo llegan a, a ciertas partes 
o a ciertos lugares peces que son pues realmente pues, eh, que tienen una como especialización muy alta porque tienen como partes de su ciclo de vida eh, como dependientes de un fenómeno específico pues se sabe que los peces por ejemplo peces, migra pues, peces migratorios como caraciformes no desoban si el río no está como en, no llega a un nivel ¿cierto? pero está pues como esta perspectiva de, de los cambios climáticos como una posibilidad de que los peces o de que los individuos las especies lleguen a nuevos a nuevas o sea capaces de dispersarse amplíen sus rangos sus home range es como, pues no es no responde solo como la como la parado la parado de los parásitos sino que pues para mí fue súper enriquecedora la Sí, es la misma fenómeno, ¿no? Sí, es la misma. Y sí, exactamente. Sí, de acuerdo. I think, I think it's true that ecological fitting is just a synonym for the nature of evolved life. It's not, it's not just about hosts and parasites. You're absolutely correct. Any kind of specialization, any kind of ecological specialization is governed by that general kind of dynamic. So you could think, for example, you could think of the different, the different river systems, the, the different, the, the cuencas diferentes, son como un intestino. So the fish, in the, it, to me, the fish in a river system are just like tapeworms in an intestine somewhere. And sometimes some of them move around in the intestine and some of them are very localized and, and it's possible that you, you have a situation in which In, in the high part of a river, there's a habitat that supports a particular fish. The lower part of that same river doesn't have that habitat, but the next river over has this. And so when you have episodes of climate change, you expect this kind of movement. But it doesn't, it doesn't mean that this, the ancestor of this fish moved all the way down here, adapted to that, came around, adapted to that, came around, adapted to that, and went up, and then convergently evolved the same specialization as here. Yes. Sometimes it's just stream capture. Yes, that's what I the revealing thing that you <laughs> teach us today, because it, it can explain a lot of patterns that it can be explained just with natural selection and movements. Oh, I, I agree. I think that's absolutely correct. Yeah. If you and in the case of, of fish and and fish behavior, behavior in general, but fish and fish behavior, if you wanted to to follow up this line of thought and develop it more, then you you should get in touch with, with uh, Deborah McLennan at the University of Toronto. The the Uh, my colleague who, who I wrote these books with, she's a specialist in fish behavior and, and has the, I mean, she's the one who, who started all of the studies in behavior and phylogeny. Um, there's another sociological issue is that because she's only a woman, she doesn't get the credit for it, but that's for another lecture. But she's somebody who really knows, she knows the organisms and she does really brilliant experimental manipulation. So she's in the lab and also in the field. And, and if you were interested in <clears throat> a sort of tropical ecosystem dynamics and these kinds of things, then uh, Sal Agosta, who, who, was, uh, who, who I've written some papers with, he was a postdoc with me. He did his PhD with Dan Jansen. He's a real tropical ecologist who also has this perspective. And his perspective comes out of insect-plant interactions in the tropics. But he and I had no problem communicating with each other because of this perspective. And you know, we see it in, in you know, rodent dynamics and, and on and on. So I think that there, there are people out there that you could follow up and amplify particular lines of research But I agree with you completely that this is a much more general phenomenon. And, and the, the uh, amismo en tiempo, at, at the same time, the parasites aren't so strange. They're not that different. They have, there's no such thing as parasite evolution. There's just evolution. 
And parasites do it the same way everything else does. Which means that, you know, they're not so over-specialized that we can control them as easily as, as we think we can. And of course, all of our, our, our practical evidence is that we're not controlling them at all. They're controlling us. It's like my, my friend Peter Watts, a science fiction writer, who, who said, um, uh, he's the one who gave me the, a, a title that I use sometimes when I talk about these things. It's called Finding Them Before They Find Us. Because they find us really easily. We're not finding them very, very well at all. Thank you very much. You're welcome. That's a great, that's a great observation. Yeah. Okay. Só gostaria de avisar então que na próxima semana o professor Brooks vai estar ministrando um curso aqui. Ele vai ministrar o curso na parte da manhã. E aí na parte da tarde a gente fica disponível para quem quer conversar, discutir alguma coisa sobre os projetos de tese. Ele vai estar com a gente semana toda, então no período da tarde. No período da manhã, a disciplina. Na semana inteira, Ricardo? Na semana inteira. Amanhã a gente está indo para Porto Rico, voltando no sábado, e a semana que vem é a semana toda. Ok? Então, thank you. Thank you very much.